start with the United States because it's the simplest. Uh, the shale revolution is very clearly entering its third phase with the super majors working on efficiency. Chevron and Exxon both are attempting to double the recovery rates from their wells over the next five years. And even if they only get halfway there, that is another five to six million barrels a day. So I don't think we're anywhere close to sealing the ceiling on what we are capable of with U.S. shale. The biggest problem we've got in that space is that all shale crude is ultra light and ultra sweet. And most of our refiners prefer to deal with heavier and sour crudes. And so at the moment, um, we've got this disconnect where we export the light sweet, we import heavy sour in order to refine. Now, those are becoming closer and closer and closer as refineries are admitting in ever a larger volume that we're never going back and that they will always have access to light sweet and they won't necessarily have access to heavy sour. Uh, but that is a transition issue more than a problem. Canada. Canada is probably maxed out. Uh, they're probably not going to get another pipeline through the United States uh, within the next decade, which means everything has to be shipped by rail and the rail export routes are running at capacity. We would have to add significantly more infrastructure to get more from them, something the refineries are really upset about because Canada provides that heavy sour that they like. Uh, the Canadians do have a pipeline that's supposed to come online next year called Trans Mountain that is supposed to export via the Pacific Coast, but the British Columbia government and a number of NGOs and some First Nations are doing everything they can to make sure that that pipeline never operates. So I have very low confidence that we'll actually get there, which means that Alberta is probably producing about as much as they're ever going to. I think it's stable, but I don't think it's going to rise. As for the rest of the world, uh, Venezuela has largely fallen off the map. Their exports are now down below a half a million barrels a day. They've basically become a non-factor. Uh, the skill sets have atrophied. They haven't trained anyone new in the last 10 years. A lot of the skill set folks have left. And in fact, in order to pay its back debts to Russia's Luke Oil uh, the, and Rosneft, they had to hand over control of Sitgo, the American refining company. And the Americans basically had a very quiet conversation with Moscow, like, just so you know, you got two choices here. You can give that back or we'll take it. And so it was given back last week. So Sitgo is back in American hands. The question is how to divvy up the shares among people who are owed money by either the Russians or Venezuelans. So we've actually had stealthily the largest nationalization in American post-World War II history, very much under the radar. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, uh, what about refineries? Are we building refineries in the United States? And if not, why? We're building a couple small new ones, but what's really happening is the existing footprint of the existing refinery stock is all being expanded. So we've added roughly four to 5 million barrels per day of distillation capacity over the last seven years. And that's in addition to a little bit of distillation that we're doing in order to prep our light sweet crude for export. We pull out some of the natural gas liquids to process them locally. So we're doing it. We're just not increasing the number of refineries. We're just increasing our overall capacity. Uh, there's an argument to be made that the American Northeast and California really, really do need to break ground on some new refineries. But until we make it legal to ship crude from the American mid-continent there, uh, that's probably not going to happen. We've got this weird law called the Jones Act that says that any cargo shipped between any two American ports has to be on a vessel that was built in America, is crewed by Americans, is captained by an American, and is owned by Americans. And any foreign ship that comes in, once they drop or pick up cargo in a specific port, they then have to go to a different country before they can come back to a different port. And we've made it very difficult for us to ship product within our own system or even crew within our, our own system. Uh, if you're in Texas, this is broadly working for you because it means you've got a captive market. You get as much of the crude as you want, but it does raise unnecessarily the cost for energy products on the coasts. In terms of other energy output, Chinese output continues to decline. Middle Eastern output is stable, kind of. Um, there's been a lot of news recently that there's more Iranian crude hitting the market. That is not true. What's happened is that some of the Iranian crude that was using black market methods of avoiding the sanctions have now found gray market methods of avoiding the sanctions. And so it's a little bit more visible. That's the only difference there. Uh, Saudi Arabia has reduced its output by another million barrels per day, or at least they say they're going to look at what they actually do. The last time they said they were going to cut output by a million, they actually raised it by 250,000 barrels. Um, 
Saudis playing a weird game here. They know now it's really sunk in that the Americans don't like them very much and that the Americans will never fight a war for them. And since we were their security guarantor for the last 70 years, they need a new one. So they are experimenting with different players, the French, the Brits, the Turks, the Chinese, the Japanese, in order to find someone who might fight for their ability to be fat and live in air conditioning. It hasn't gone great. Why, why isn't the U.S. more active in developing uh, nuclear energy plants, especially smaller ones? But two, you know, which leads to some of the things you've talked about, our ability to um, create more solar or wind powered uh, options. The American Southwest is one of the top three solar zones in the world. And the American Great Plains are one of two great wind zones in the world. And so these are areas that even with existing technology, assuming no improvements in transmission or storage, already makes sense to deploy mass volumes of capital to generate electricity in those two areas with those two technologies. Now, one of the things that the infl in let's try that again. One of the things that the Inflation Reduction Act, an act that has nothing to do with inflation, uh, does is it expands credit access to generation systems in the green tech space. And that vastly improves the economics for solar and wind in the United States outside of those two zones. So they've basically doubled, maybe even increased by two and a half times, the land area of the United States where solar and wind make a great deal of sense. So just with this one law, we have probably enabled the United States to get roughly one quarter, maybe as much as one third of their electricity from solar and wind 10 years from now. That's a really big step forward, whether you're green or you just like the math of getting free electricity. That's really helped. Nowhere else in the world near populated centers has that kind of advantage outside of Australia. Um, and I, I broadly don't have a problem with that. Now, that doesn't mean that these areas are going 100% green, uh, although places where it overlaps, like West Texas, very well may. Uh, but it does push us a lot more in the direction of energy security and a less carbon intensive system. They're not perfect technologies, but for these geographies, they're pretty close. Biden, one of the things that he's doing right now is he's trying to recoup democratic uh, support for the union movement. Uh, the IRA was very big in that. Uh, remember that during the Trump administration, uh, Trump was very, very successful at, uh, at courting the union vote. And a majority of union members did vote for Trump in round two. And so Biden now is trying to pull those guys back into the Democratic coalition and doing anything that loosens the tariffs in any meaningful way with China would be working the other direction. So there is a case to be made that the tariffs are unnecessarily inflationary. Uh, uh, that's a very complicated, nuanced discussion with a lot of pros and cons. It is real, but siding with the people who want the tariffs to go away would probably cost Biden the union vote, and he's fought very, very hard to get that back, so I don't see it happening.